All right, in this video, we're going to be going over the front brakes on the Genesis G70, which would be the same as the Kia Stinger. And there's already plenty of videos out there, especially on the Kia Stinger and how to do the front brakes. So what we're going to try to do in this video, is why I am going to go over the front brakes, is I'm going to go over the specs first. Um, you know, why I'm doing brakes on a car that only has 16,000 miles on it. These cars are kind of notorious for having um, brake pad issues. Once again, this also includes the Kia Stinger. I'm also going to go over leaving the brakes, the sequence of doing that. And then I'll link, you know, the particular pads and rotors I used, um, any special tools I used, etc. Uh, in the description of the video. All right, so let's get to the first part which is the specs. I do not want to waste your time. So if you need to take your caliper off, which you would need to do to change your rotor, the bolt head size is a 17 millimeter and a torque specs are 72 to 86 foot pounds. If you're going to bleed the brakes, the uh, bleeder screws are an 11 millimeter. You have two of them. You bleed the inside first and bleed the outside one. And the spec is 12 to 14 foot pounds. Now the sequence of bleeding the brakes is a little, um, I'll say people make it controversial. It shouldn't be, but there's always this old school mentality, the one farthest away from the master cylinder. And as brake systems have become more complicated, that has kind of changed. And generally, um, you know, you can look up, the manufacturer's recommendations of the sequence, which I have. If you want to do it the old school method, you know, go ahead and do it. But I'm just going to go based on what the Kia Stinger had, which these cars are basically identical, so it should apply as well. So this is the cars with the Brembo brakes, to be clear. If you have a Genesis that doesn't have Brembo brakes, the bleeding sequence is different. So you're going to start on the passenger front, then the driver front, the driver rear, and the passenger rear. So once again, you can start on your passenger front caliper, move to your driver side front caliper. You're going to go to the rear of the car on the driver side to that caliper and finish on the passenger side rear caliper. And once again with the Brembo brakes, you bleed your inside bleeder screw first, and then you bleed the outside bleeder screw. So that is the sequence. And I'm going to go over at the end of the video, the last thing I do, I'll go over the, the pressure bleeder I have and the right cap. And, you know, of course, you may have a different brand, so the cap wouldn't apply. So the brakes I went with are, I think, called Advix. Advix right here. Oh, I got these off of Rock Auto. Um, I also got the rotors as well. So this company is owned by the ASIN, ASIN Group which is a Japanese company. Uh, Toyota has significant ownership in, um, you know, they're kind of famous ASIN for their transmissions that they make, but they also, it's kind of like a conglomerate company. It's made up of multiple companies, of different names, that own a whole bunch of little things or have partnerships with, like it goes deep. But this is part of the ASIN group. Um, I think they're probably a pretty good pad. I also want their rotors. Um, the rotors are standard certified high carbon rotors. I weighed them. They're within one pound. I'd actually be a little bit heavier than the OEM rotor. Um, they seem like good quality. So before we get to actually knocking these pads out, um, I've already did the other side. It's fairly easy. It's my first time actually doing brakes on a Brembo equipped car. I've done a ton of brake jobs, just not on Brembo brakes. The reason these cars have so many brake issues is not the rotor. I was like, work the rotors. The rotors are trash. I work the rotors. I work the rotors. I'm going to tell you something right now. Unless you're taking your car on an F1 track, you're not working your brake rotors. This whole thing of this vibration people get, they think the rotors work. What happens is you have uneven pad buildup on your rotor surface. The pads have deposited material unevenly on a rotor. This creates high and low spots. And that is why you get that vibration. 
the high and low spots on a rotor from the brake pad embedded material on the rotor surface. Brake pads embedding material on a rotor surface is normal. That's actually part of braking in your brakes is actually embedding some of that friction material on the new rotors. And that friction material that she's embedded on the rotor and between the pad are what make the brakes work well and is why broken brakes work better than just slapping immediately new brakes on the car. Problem is, the factory pads are just absolute garbage. And as normal, Honda Kia slash Genesis always continues to fail at ever delivering customer satisfaction. They don't give a crap. They give you two middle fingers. That's just how the company is. They don't care. Unless there's a class action lawsuit that forces them to do something, they're pretty much never going to do the right thing. And the dealerships are absolute trash because they're still left over from when Honda and Kia made dirt cheap cars and people went and buy them, were uneducated, had terrible credit scores. So the salesmen were absolute slime balls and just took advantage of people. And that mentality is still in those dealerships. Genesis knows that their biggest problem as a brand is actually their dealership experience, which is absolute trash compared to any other luxury plan where you're treated with respect. The Lexus dealership is yes sir, no ma'am. Here's a, here's a car for you to drive home. Do would you like a bottle of water? Let me open up the door for you. Genesis is like, good luck even someone getting to pick up the phone. With that said, all the dealership is going to do, and it very much depends on your dealership, is they're going to take your rotors off. They're going to turn your brake rotors. Maybe they have an on-car brake lay. They can leave the rotor on and do that. All that's now what that's going to fix your problem temporarily because you've removed all of the high and low spots off your rotor surface. But eventually, those brake pads that they didn't change are going to once again embed uneven material on the rotor surface and your vibration is going to return. Um, now this only applies to the American market. Over in the European market, they used a more aggressive brake pad that did not do that. And it's quite expensive, like four or $500. It's absurdly expensive if you try to buy it. So don't. The reason they use that in the European market is Americans are sensitive to brake noise. People in America think brake noise equals there's something wrong with brakes. Not true whatsoever. And Europeans have higher standards for brakes than we do. They're more likely to use higher, more aggressive brake pads, which are more prone to, especially at certain temperatures, moisture, etc., make brake noise. So they went with quiet pads that don't make noise, but will absolutely leave uneven crap all over your rotors. And now you're doing a brake job at 16,000 miles, which you probably should have done at 1,000 miles because they're trash from day one. So that's enough of me ranting about the sorriness of how they handle things. So let's get to it. The first thing we're going to do is I'm going to, well, before you waste your time actually doing this, so there's going to be these screws that are in your brake rotor. Now I used a Phillips number three screwdriver. Phillips number three screwdriver to take them out. Now technically you don't have to put these screws back. I'm going to, I'll put a little lubricant on them and you know, just snug them down, not too tight. But all these are for is that during the manufacturing process, when the car is going down the assembly line, it holds the brake rotors on the car, keeps them in place and keeps them from falling off the car, misaligning that way they can just drop the caliper assembly on. So that's it. They don't, those little screws are not what are holding on your brake rotor, your wheel, entire assembly bolts to your studs is what is pushing up against your brake rotor and holding it in place. Not those itty bitty little screws. They're just there to um so if you they're just there to hold the rotor under and break uh the manufacturing process. So if you do damage them if you have to drill them out or something, you know, don't freak out. You can continue off your brake job and everything's gonna be okay. But if you're gonna change the rotors before you start, maybe try to get the screws out because Notorious and all sorts of cars, those things being corroded and stuck and a crap. And I wish manufacturers would do something else because they're just plain stupid. All right. So the first thing we got to do is we got to knock these pins out, which I'm going to go over and I'm going to show you a special tool. You don't need a special tool, by the way. You can just use just a regular punch. But this tool, way overpriced for what it is, it's like $25 to $30. It should be like 5 bucks. 
prevents you from necessarily uh, chipping your brake caliper assembly. So I'm gonna get that tool and I'm gonna knock those pins out. All right, so I got this little tool here, which will be in the description of this video. And all it is, it has a little flat point in it, a little divot in, that allows you to put it over top there. And there's a little dent in this end as well, instead of being like a blunt point sharp, it allows you to also put it over top of that. And what it prevents you, when it's not pointy, but if you're doing a regular punch, like an L punch or something like that, it's very easy to go bloop, and you end up smacking your other and you, you know, take a nice chunk of the paint out. So with this, take your big end like that, take a little rubber mallet, you're just unseating it just off the back. Then we're gonna take, flip it around. It fits right over that point. Like so, and out she goes. And same thing with the other one. Out she goes. Now you may have to put a little pressure, push down on your uh, brake caliper spring, which I'll show you after I get it out. Get these out. And those are your pins, by the way, they're both the same size. And hold on to these as sometimes some brake pads will come with new ones. A lot of times people recommend using the original ones as they tend to be better quality. And also the ones that you get replacement, a lot of times are not the right size. They're either too short, the diameter is wrong, etc. This brakes actually did come with new hardware. Um, and they're actually sized differently than the original ones. So just wipe these off and we'll go to the next step. So the next step. If, now this is if you're just changing pads, you would just simply take your spring and this comes out. But, it, but we're also going to be changing our rotors out. So we're gonna take this off, there's two bolts. They're back here, they said they're 17 millimeters. And I'm going to uh, zip those out and then Loosen them up a little bit, but with this, what you want to do, you're going to have to put a little bit of pressure on both sides just to try to push the piston back just a little bit to loosen the tension, and this will just come right on out like that. And then there you go. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take a spreader. Once again, I'll show you the tool. I don't have the part for that to push these pistons back. And I'm going to show you how way I like to do it. You don't have to do it this way. This is my preferred method and how I learn how to do it in automotive school. All right, so if you notice, I have bleeder bottles on my bleeder screws. I just have them slightly loosened. Once I uh, mentioned they're 11 millimeter. You don't have to do this. I do it this way because I don't like to push brake fluid back through the ABS system. That dirty fluid, which most cars are not really dirty. I don't like to push that dirty fluid and they're not really that far out is because there's still tons of pad material left because car only has 16,000 miles on it. But this is how I like to do it. It's how I learned it in automotive school. And it's a way to prevent of ever pushing nasty fluid back to your system. And I'll have these bottles in the description too because these are quite nice. They have magnets on them and they have a one-way check valve. So stuff can only go in one direction. So I have this spreader tool that has spreaders on both sides because we have pistons on both sides like your traditional brake system like your floating calipers only you just have pistons so you can use a c-clamp and just push it we got to push on both sides this tool is like 15 bucks and it has worked just fine so i'm going to retract the tool back uh, front or rear doesn't matter and we're just going to push it out and we're just going to push those pistons back now, it'd be a lot more obvious if these brakes were wore down as the pistons would be really pushed out and you could actually really see them getting pushed in. These were really not pushed out much. But anyway, I'm gonna continue on this. The only thing I wanna say is be careful with this arm here. As you start to move it out, you don't want it to drag up against your caliper and scratch your paint. So keep your hands over here. And so I'm gonna retract this one and I'm gonna go to the other one and retract that one. All right, so. I've tightened my bleeder screws back down. I'm going to take these off. Remember, brake fluid, paint are not friends. 
So do not get brake fluid on your paint. And you'll notice this is the dirty, this is, I already did the other front side. So between the two front sides, that's how much brake fluid I ended up pushing out the caliper that didn't go back. It says, now this brake fluid car looks really good, but I'm still going to do a brake fluid flush on it. So now what we're going to do, I've already loosened the bolts to speed this up, but you got your bolts on the back here. By the way, there is a washer. It's not built onto the bolt. It likes to fall off, so make sure you have that washer on your bolt. Like I said, those are 72, I think, to 86 foot pounds, 17 millimeter. So get the other side off. And then what we're gonna do, I'm gonna take a hook and I'm gonna hang it up. And if you notice, I have my brake caliper with this little thing. I little two pack was like six bucks, super cheap. So I just have a hook to one of the bolt holes and I have it hung on the spring. This, these calipers are quite heavy. Do not let these dangle by the brake hose. These are significantly more heavy and beefier than like your standard little single piston uh, floating caliper. The next step, now obviously your brake screws need to be up before do this, is get this rotor off. Now I found that the other side was quite stuck and I'm not going to put y'all through the noise, but basically I'm going to take a hammer and I'm going to hit on the outside surface around the rotor to get the rotor freed from the back of the hub. And so that's the next step we're going to do. So after we've taken the hammer, banged around the rotor surface to break it loose, we pull the rotor off. If you want to, you can take a wire brush and clean back here if you want, depending on how much uh, build up. This is just a little bit of surface rust. There's something really built out. You take a little break clean and Clean the back side of this stuff a little bit, but you know it's gonna get dirty instantly anyway. It's a great time to give your calipers a little bit of a wipe down if you want to. So these uh, rotors that I got come in this nice you know, bag, certified high carbon. They are a coated rotor, so they're not oily. You don't have to take brake clean and wipe them off. There's no oil or anything on them. They are a fully coated rotor and are ready to install out of the bag. So I'm going to take our rotor and what we're going to try to do is we put the rotor on just mine where your little screw holes are and just line your rotor up based on those. So Take a rotor, which is 25 pounds by the way, and that's it. So the rotor's on the car. And what we're gonna do, we're just gonna take our screws and we're gonna lightly tighten those down. Don't, don't go crazy. If you want to, you can put a little anti seize just a little bit of lubricant on most of these screw threads, prevent them from getting stuck. But real light, just gonna Snug them down one hand, not to no wrenches here, no pliers, nothing like that. So those are snug. Next step is take our two brake cop bolts. Make sure, of course, washers are on them. They like to fall off, and put your caliper on and run your bolts through. So that's what we're gonna do next. So we have our brake caliper installed. Once again, 17 millimeter, 72 to 86 foot pounds. Um, so use a torque wrench, how I suggest, uh, cause that type of torque is um, uh, just till snug, is not gonna cut it. I mean, it's tighter than you think it is. You're probably definitely having some compression of that washer. So next thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put the pads in, but I'm gonna do something I notice other people aren't doing. And I'm not saying you have to do this. This is just my opinion. I don't install brake pads dry. I believe they should have brake lubricant on the back. And typically you always see this. I know so this style of brakes, you don't. Uh, and the reason we do this really is one, is to prevent 
break noise and also helps prevent the pads from being stuck here. But these are not a floating pad. It's probably not a big of a deal. But I am going to take some high temp brake lubricant and I want to put it on the back of the pads. And after I do that, I'm going to show you which pads to uh, make sure you install the pads correctly. Um, you know, because you have two different so um, sides. So I'll put the lube on and I'll show you how much I kind of put on and then we'll drop the pads in. All right, so we're going to drop our pads in. Now you can see I got a little brake lubricant just on the backing plate. You notice you have this little, we call it, we call these squeal tabs. Now it's when the brake pads get low, they're not touching the rotor surface and squealing, like, you know, hey, you need brakes. Maybe if you put new pads in, you can save the rotors from being destroyed. Okay. So this go on this car, they were on the outside of the caliper, not the inside. They were on the outside of the caliper. And they were facing down towards the back of the car. So I did the other side. I made sure I put the right one in that was facing down Not the other side going up. And you notice also you have an R and an L like right and left on these things. And you'll notice on your other ones you do as well. So if you flip the pad around, if you have the pads in the R, like if there's an R over here, you're going to have an L. There's L here, there's R there. So they're the opposite in this direction. So if you have R, R, L, L, uh, you, you probably installed the wrong pair of pads with each other. So these are super simple on these things. All you do, grab these big old little counterweights, whatever they are here at the top, and just, whoop, there they go. Um, that's why installing pads in the car, if you're just doing pads, once you got your wheel off, not rotors, and you've had done this a few times, you can literally have old pads out and you set the pads in in literally like five minutes. Uh, that's one of the reasons why these brakes are designed this way. So, next thing we're going to do, we're going to take our pins and our clip. Now, if you notice about these little brake pins, there's a little collar up here. This is what holds it in place. This, well, if, if these were a floating brake caliper, you end up always cleaning your pins, lubing them up really well because the pads slide back and forth on them. They get bound up on the, on the fixed caliper system like this. Just wipe them off and you're fine. There's no need for lube as they're just holding the spring, this little spring clip in place and making and also positioning the pads incorrectly because these pads would continue to drop down. So that's what holds the pads up and what holds this uh, anti-rattle spring place so what I'm trying to do here get a close view for y'all is we're going to take our spring clip etc you know put the pins in reverse so your collar is going to be on your back side it's going to slide through the back of the caliper it's going to go through the hole in your brake um, brake pad and then you're going to slide it across the surface. And the hardest part, it's not even hard, is it's just awkward because I'm doing it when I'm making a video. Um, is pulling this pad up to line up with the hole and then pushing it all the way through. So backside through over top here, through this pad, and then the tip of it. Is right here and then we're going to do the other side then we're going to pound it in um, and lock it into place with that little sleeve so since this is kind of the important step we will film this so we're going to take this you have to push this little uh, clip down it has got a little tension on it now same thing through the pad through the back of the caliper through your pad hole over top in that little slot, you have to pull your pad up a little bit, which is like I said, it's just trying to see where the hole is because this pad will continue to drop down. All right, I'm gonna pause the video for a second to push that through. Sorry, guys, had to get my face in there. I think I wanted to not be able to see anything. So, once again, same thing. 
when you're doing the other side, whichever I side first, you may have to, there's going to be a little tension, so you may have to push the spring down just a little bit. But super simple, caliper, screw pad, over top this little spring, this groove here, all the way through, and that. And then we're going to drive it in here in a second. We're going to try to get a real close-up view here, and at least y'all can see one of them getting driven in. And remember that tool I told y'all about? We're going to use it here again. We're going to put it on the back side like this, and just till it kind of gets flush. Now we're going to flip it around, get to this other side here. And as you start to see, it's starting to come through. Face this other side. I'm just going to hit it a few more times to make sure it is locked in place, but I believe it is. And it should be actually a little bit below this uh, indention back here where it goes through. It sits not flush, but just a little bit below flush. If it's still kind of flush, you probably can go a little bit farther with it. As you can see how far this one is still out. So let me drive this through, and I'm going to drive the other one through, and we'll go to the next step. So we got both sides in and drove in. You can see your pads. You remember how it looks. Remember this goes across here. Got both ends. Point it out. Technically, at this point, if you're not going to do a brake flush, you would be done. You'd put your tire in, torque it to spec, and go out there. And depending on the pads you install, the manufacturer may have a bedding process, certain speeds, how many stops, etc. These particular pads had no bedding process. You can hook one up online, or you can just do some general light driving and get them broke in. Of course, I'm going to let you know uh, in a comment. I'll pin a comment of what I think of these brakes and once they get broke in and I have to get some time on them. Um, so just giving just a new impression, they turn out not to be so great in the long run. So we're going to bleed brakes. And after we bleed, after I show you how to bleed the brakes and the tools I'm using, brake fluid I'm using, etc., we're going to wrap this video up. All right, so what we have is a brake pressure bottle or a power bleeder. There are different brands and models, so I'll also have a link description to this particular uh, brand, which I believe is AR. It's an AREs, and of course, there's different adapters and caps. Um, I will obviously have the particular cap I use in the description, so y'all can purchase it um, as one that comes with does not work. I had to, you know, purchase an adapter, so. There is our uh, adapter, which just has a little quick connect that it connects to. So the first thing you want to do, which I've already done, is when you do these power bleeders, after you put your cap on, connect it in with your bottle. Don't put any brake fluid in it. Just put it on, pump it up to 10, 15 PSI, let it sit for like a minute. Is it leaking? Were you able to build up pressure? If you're built up pressure, you're probably good, but is the pressure really starting to go down? Uh, your cap's probably not still. And this is going to prevent you from pumping in with brake fluid and your cap starts leaking everywhere. So we're trying to make sure we don't have a leak before we put the brake fluid in. So then we're just going to put our brake fluid, you know, in our bottle. And then I'm going to show you what brake fluid I purchased. So this is the brake fluid I got. It's a dot four. Uh, brake fluid, but you know that's an SL6.4. Now the spec here is just regular old dot four brake fluid is perfectly fine. SL6, typically are a little, it's a little bit more pricey. They typically have a little bit higher boiling point, but what the main difference is is they're low viscosity. They're thinner, and they're really meant to an, uh, to make it allows the ABS system and your stability control, which uses ABS, to perform faster because the fluid, it can move the fluid quicker through the valves and through the system and modulate things quicker, allowing the system to operate more efficiently and faster. 
many manufacturers, especially German manufacturers, and Germans definitely have the highest standard when it comes to brakes. They, they take their stuff seriously when it comes to brake fluids and also actually changing their brake fluid. They normally recommend like every two years um, and plenty of cars in America are probably 15 years old and they have never had the brake fluid touched once and brake fluid absorbs water is the problem. It pulls moisture in through the air and that contaminates the brake fluid. So I got two bottles and you know, since this is a uh, this is a German company, Liquid Molly, um, they come in liters. They're not quarts. So you're getting a whopping extra 33.8 ounces instead of 32 ounces. So we're going to pour this brake fluid into my brake bleeder. I'm going to connect it and I'm going to pump it up. And then I will show you how I we bleed the brake system. Of course, I'm just going to show you all one tire. I'm not going to walk you through all four tires because every single one is identical on this car. There is no difference. All right. So I'm going to get the brake fluid in the bottle and get this connected, get this thing pumped up, and I'll show you the pressure on the gauge. All right, so brake fluid is in the bottle. Take a little quick connect we have for this brake. So different manufacturers are going to have different things. So this may not apply. It is connected, and we're going to pump, pump, pump it up here. So as you can see, I have the pressure about 30 psi. Um, a lot of times I only bleed at like 15. Hyundai actually recommends if you do a pressure bleed, they have a specialized tool. It uses an air compressor. And this is for like the, um, if you got air into the hydraulic control unit, up to 44 psi, which sounds like a lot, but a lot, but eh, I've, I've seen higher than that. But we're just pushing fluid through this as a brake fluid flush. You can certainly push it that high if you want, but there's no air in the system really, and we're not having replaced the hydraulic control unit. Just set that down on the car, make sure it's secure. I mentioned it before, brake fluid and paint. They're not friends with another. other. What's nice about this pressure bleeder, it's just gonna auto feed that fluid in as it's being pushed out, okay? All right, like I said, we have our inside nipple, our outside nipple, inside one. First bottle is connected, like I said, nice magnet. 11 millimeter counterclockwise, just enough to get the fluid flowing. This fluid's really clean. So if you're really doing this, you probably only need just a little quick little top 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 up. One bottle would be sufficient. Really four ounces to each nipple, four total, that's 32 ounces, uh, eight ounces per caliper. I got two bottles, they're opened. Um, I'm going to do a full flush. I'm going to be using all two bottles to the system. Like I said, just follow that sequence I gave at the start of the video, which was, I believe, driver front. No, sorry, passenger front. So that's what we're at. Passenger front. Then driver front. Driver rear. Passenger rear. So passenger front. Driver front, passenger, driver rear, passenger rear. And that kind of concludes this video. Like I said, all of the specialty parts they use, like the punch, the brake caliper spreader, um, will be in the description of the video with links. I will put the part numbers to these pads, to the rotors. Um, I will also put some type of link to some type of brake fluid, whether it's this type or something very similar. Uh, I'll have for the size of some magnetic bottle and I'll end up eventually pinning the comment of what I think about these um, brake pads as they break in. But I know this was a long video, but I just, longer than I wanted it to be, but just trying to cover everything about these cars and there's plenty of short ones out there that can get straight to the point but i covered the specs at first try not to waste your time and anyway i hope someone found this helpful until next time guys i hope you all have a good day